What is up, everybody? My magic, powerful hands are doing their thing again. I am so happy to be back in the booth. We have a double feature today. It's amazing. Not only do we have one, but we have two super powerful, amazing human beings from Google, the mighty Google on the show today. First up is Ryan Warrender and Mustafa Kurtuldu. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too badly. Our guest on today's show, guests, plural, guys, plural. Ryan, he's the product partnership manager at Google. He's a former mobile UX lead. He supports companies with AMP, progressive web apps. I don't even know what that means. It sounds super fancy, Matthew. He's got <laughs> eight plus years as a UX designer, and he even volunteers at Google Startups and is a jury member at Awards and Webby. Missed him at Awards because he was busy doing other things, really important things. Mustafa. Design Senior Advocate Google through Material Design, Progressive Web Apps, and Google Design Sprints. 19 plus years as a UX designer, publishing, charity, central government, education, and finance. Now these two have have come together to join forces to do today's show, so this is going to be packed with value. They've worked together at Google on mobile hackathons and design sprints. They've even collaborated on an ebook on Progressive Web Apps, the future like that, the future of the mobile web. We're going to be talking about web design trends. And they gave me a little outline, a little preview about what we're going to talk about today. It sounds so fascinating. I don't even understand it. Web design versus UX design. I understand that. Web design versus UX design. I want to get clarity on that. And some web design trends about being instant, helpful, capable, and probably some resources that they'll share at the end of the show or we'll include in the show notes. Let's welcome, guys, Ryan and Mustafa. Woo! Welcome to the show! Yeah. Woo! All right, all right. Okay, guys, I'm intimidated. I think you hinted at possibly critiquing the Futures website, so I'm scared. I know if it goes poorly, it's all Ben Burns' fault. <laughs> but we'll just get to that when we get to it. So I'm going to turn over the show to you guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here and doing this with us. Yeah, Chris, thanks so much for having us. Uh, before we kind of jump into it, I just wanted to give a huge thank you for everything you do for the design community. I've been a uh, long time fan of the future and all the content that you put out for free is like greatly appreciated oh by that's everyone. gonna get a belding right there <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you can hear that but i just rang the bell <laughs> um cool so i think like the best place to get started is mustafa and i will give like a rough background okay. of you know, kind of what we do because um i think our titles can be you know they're fairly general but um i'll go first and then mustafa you can follow me up but um so yeah my name is ryan warrender I, uh, I, I'm, I think the best way of thinking about my career was like when I was in college, I was a study graphic design. The job market wasn't too hot at the time. So I actually hedged my bet with, you know, supplementing it with a business degree. So then right out of school, I joined a, uh, an IT leadership program at GE, which was great because it showed me what I like and also what I don't like. So while in that, while, you know, working for GE, I started, uh, I had a rotation in human computers interaction. Um, which is basically like UX um, back in the day. Um, but I had a really good mentor from this company called Human Factors um, International. And it really was like my first chance to like fall in love with UX as a career. And I really became energized by, you know, the idea that, um, you know, when in this, you know, when in this role, I could solve critical business problems, you know, help people and also help people become more productive. So, you know, following that, I kind of went all in on becoming a UX designer um, this was, you know, a while ago, but I went, I read everything on the internet. I tried to watch as many YouTube videos on UX design at the time. Unfortunately, the future wasn't out when I was coming up. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. You should have got on that earlier. Chris. I know, right? We missed the ball. I got that's it. On, that's on, that's on you for not doing it a little that's earlier. True. I take full responsibility for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then basically I, I feel super lucky. I applied for a job at Google. I got my foot in the door. It's always was like a dream company for me to work there. And then, uh, you know, just kind of bringing it to where I'm at now. So since being at Google, my career is really centered around like helping companies craft better web experiences. Mm. So my time was uh, working as a mobile UX lead and our team had a very simple but ambitious goal, which was to make the mobile web better for everyone. So that's to help companies have more performant, more effective sites at meeting their users' goals. So we, we, you know, we worked with small to medium sized businesses and we were, I would describe what we did as like UX consultants. Uh, we would work with web dev teams and provide recommendations on performance. So how can their site become faster? Uh, usability, how can it become more intuitive? And then accessibility, making sure that, you know, you're designing for a, a broad, diverse group of users. Um, so yeah, it was pretty straightforward. We championed for the end users. And then along the way, I, you know, met Mustafa, we've been kind of 
good design friends at Google. Our teams don't work, you know, directly together, but we always find opportunity opportunities to collaborate. And then, uh, yeah, most recently, I joined a team called the Web Product Partnerships Team, and we help, you know, companies uh, test new web capabilities such as progressive web apps and AMP, which we might get into a little bit. But I'll kick it over to you, to Mustafa. Yeah, I mean, I can do some spiel. Uh, I mean, I started off as a graphic designer. Uh, I don't think UX as a discipline really existed like 20 plus years ago. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just graphic designer kind of evolved. You know, it's like the typical story. You see like the blink tag on the web. Oh my God, I can move things on a screen. Mm -hmm. And then be like, throw all the graphic design stuff away and then spend um, 10 years trying to figure out how to actually make things and banging my head against a brick wall um, saying, what is this HTML stuff? Um, and then, you know, fast forward to um, five years ago, I was doing stuff in the community, speaking on stage, basically like by day, UX designer, by night, um, speaker. Uh, and then Google picked up on it and they invited me for like an interview. I became a design advocate, which is basically a UX designer who advocates design best practices from Google's perspective. So material design, UX on the web, Android stuff. Um, and so I've kind of grown in this role, and so we produce a lot of content, like books, make example apps that designers and developers can steal, use, beg, borrow, whatever. Um, and yeah, like working with the material team, trying to sort of like promote that and sort of explain uh, how it is for designers, you know. Um, and yeah, so it's like I have my own show on YouTube, like podcast as well, just plugging that, because why not? Um, <laughs> Because might as well, and so yeah. So I, I right, so last week we were with like at Google I/O, which is our yearly conference. So that's the chance where we get to speak with developers um, and actually have this feedback loop. So we, we call it an advocacy role because you have like the evangelist type roles in other companies, which is like it feels like you're speaking at the community. We're like an advocate. We're listening to the challenges that the community has, and we represent them internally at Google, and then we come up with a solution. So like material design, whatever, and we push that back to the community. Um, so that it's like a two way. Um, feedback loop. Um, so yeah, no, it's a great role. Uh, it's a very interesting one. Um, but yeah, that's me. Great. Fantastic. I have a question for both of you guys. It seems like Google is this giant benevolent company who's trying to help the web be better for everyone. It, does this come at a price to the people that you consult for? Uh, generally speaking, not. I mean, like, as you mean prices, do we charge the people? Yeah, like, does us? Google send them a bill after you leave their office? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, uh, like it's in Google's best interest to keep the web alive. Like obviously, like I mean, it's there is some altruism there, obviously. But at the end of the day, it's like the core business is, is like the web, right? And, right? and also Android. So like, um, also it's like there's the thing is like the reason why material design exists is because Android previously didn't feel like a premium platform. It felt like you know everyone was just stuff inconsistent. So it's like how can we make this like a premium thing? So that's how material design was born. Mm -hmm. Like how can you make does, uh, web developers realize that? Um, when you're designing an app, it's not just a singular app, it's, it's part of a family and ecosystem together. So how can you get like a coherent uh, standard library of things that people can conform to, but at the same time have uniqueness? So like um, we do this consultancy to sort of, because we, it's like in our best interest to make sure the platforms that we're on are actually high quality. Mm. So yeah. to the uninitiated, what is material design? Can you say that in layman terms? So material design is basically like our style guideline of what we think is best UX, best practice for um, digital design. I see Be it like mobile apps, uh, like assistant machine learning stuff, as we've just started introducing now. Sound design, like how we. So it's like there was like three buckets: materials and metaphor. So um, once upon a time, some Google designers came together. It's like okay, we're designing these things on screens, these pixels. But what are these pixels made of? And that kind of triggered this whole idea of like it's a material. It's a, uh, this what they called quantum paper. Um, it's getting really conceptual now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for like, making it easy for us to understand. So it's Quantum like, what is paper. This material? Yeah. What are the what are the rules of this of this material? So mm -hmm. you've got like say a card on screen. What are the rules like when it expands? What's supposed to happen when it contracts? When you know um, when it bounces? Like what are the things? And from there they built like, the design language, like the typeface, the type system, the color system, um, what accessibility means, uh, UX writing. What does that mean? How you design motion? Like, um, so like a typical thing is when someone first gets into motion design, they just flash bang everywhere. But we know from like research that um, if you want someone to focus on one part of the screen when someone clicks on a button, you want to get rid of everything else as quickly as possible, but then have that part really expand because that's how the eye works. It focuses on like, you know, like motion in that right. way. Um, so it's like all these things were quite new to a lot of designers because we just designed static web page, the final fully finished thing. 
but like motion design accessibility isn't something that we're naturally taught like in design university so it's like that material design became this thing was like how do you advocate design best practice as a as a standard um does that make sense it totally makes sense thank you for clearing that up it really does yeah and i think that, that just to kind of put in perspective if you've used you know any google product a lot of the design obviously within the product is using material so mm -hmm. that's a kind of a, a very applicable way to see it in action yeah, I, I just want to say something about this kind of altruistic approach that Google has that has impressed me uh, and, and me kind of experiencing it firsthand just to get this part over with is as a person who creates content on YouTube, it's amazing that Google slash YouTube has built a facility and to assign reps to help creators grow their channel and they put on workshops and they feed you and they invite and pay for people to come and teach you all just for the sake of community. And that blew me away. It's like very few companies at this size do things like that. They sh they're still thinking about the creator or the designer. Yes, because the I audience. Mean, I, I totally makes... agree. I mean, that Mustafa and I both have done multiple events with that goal in mind. And I think it's a very mutually beneficial relationship too, where we try to keep our ear to the ground on like, you know, where designers and developers running into challenges. And that's obviously very valuable feedback so we can continually innovate and make, you know, the best po possible products and experiences. Mm-hmm. I like the audience makes the actual content, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the audience that does it. Uh, yeah. We can design as much as we want, but if no one's using or looking at our products, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. It's right. like if, a, if an app's in a forest and no one's there to tap on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and so it's like, I think sometimes like we're really in a privileged position to be like, be, to be able to speak to the community, but right. really it's the community that actually puts us in this position. So to, to give back to them as much as possible, um, and I, mean, I speak for Ryan, I'll speak for Ryan, I'll speak for you here, but we really love this community, right? And we really care about passionately that people are able, empowered to design the right things um, in the right possible way. And it's like I said, a feedback group. We're learning, we want to teach, we want to learn from the community as well. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So why don't we do this? I'm going to tee you guys up for possibly a, a, a pretty meaty conversation about the difference between web design and UX design. Yeah. I mean, the reason that I thought this was an interesting topic is I have a lot of friends that started their careers as graphic designers and UX became a super trendy career to get into, you know, a couple of maybe like 10 years ago. But, you know, web design really is just like the process of creating a website, it includes like the layout, the content, the production, the graphic design, where user experience is at the actual process of creating products that provide, you know, meaningful, relevant experiences. So in other words, like the UX is how the site feels to a user, whereas, um, and that's really what, you know, Mustafa and I's job is and when, you know, and I work with um, a partner, it's that we want to make sure that it is their, their, their websites are as intuitive as possible. So I just think it's an interesting topic because a lot of people think that they're bucketed in one or the other. And there's been a ton of roles that have come up where people say like, you know, they're really good at one thing. So I'm like a big advocate and like a lot of a lot of us, you know, follow a similar process where it's like, you know, uh, I think a good UX designer kind of follows a similar uh, overall user flow, which is, you know, do the research up front, really understand who the users are, um, put yourself in their perspective. The next is to create the user story. So like I've seen on other episodes of the future, you guys talk about like user personas and making sure you're creating for the right audience. Um, and then doing, you know, low fidelity wireframes to high fidelity mockups to launching the site and the changes and then doing A-B testing. So that's kind of like what I would describe as my UX process. Um, and as a mobile UX lead, I got to work with companies through that end-to-end -end process. So um, I'll let Mustafa obviously chime in on, 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 his, uh, on his tape. Yeah, and no, usually with web design, people think about just like, <laughs> they think, uh, well, let me take a step back. One of the challenges that designers have is we're really restricted by our tools. So like a web designer is going to be designing something in Photoshop or Sketch or Illustrator. What they're doing is really designing an approximation, like this visual graphics rather than what actually gets made. Like a UX designer is thinking about all the steps someone takes to get through a flow. Um, they're not thinking about, you know, the nice, impressive uh, logo or so much like loading animations that they're thinking about. What, how does someone say buy a ticket on like an airline website? What right. are the steps? What are the caveats? What are the use cases? Um, what happens if they don't buy a ticket and they come back? Are you still going to show them the experience part way through so that it's not as obtrusive that they have to start again? Um, what are the things that you can help solve the pay, pain points? And you think how many times you've gone to a website or an app and it just feels broken, like something's, you know, you're, you're trying to buy something, something fails, the internet connection dies, or 
whatever, um, you feel like, oh, you have to start again. And it's like a UX designer is trying to find all these pain points and how you direct yourself with technology. Um, where a web designer might. But at the same time, like a web designer is a form of UX designer as well, um, if they're designing in that way. I suppose right. it's really um, ha the process rather than the job title or like how you feel personally responsible to create something that actually works, right? Yeah. Right. So from my perspective and what I've heard in terms of job opportunities, there's a lot of job opportunities for people who do UX that there's a pretty good pay for people who do UX. So how do you determine from your point of view, who is good at doing UX? Like, what do you look at? Because you talked about wireframes and lo-fi mockups and just designing the journey. How do you show that? If I'm a person graduating from school or I'm five years out of school, like, how can somebody tell the difference between somebody who's just starting and somebody who's really, really good at UX design? Uh, well, like, I remember about five, six years ago, I've seen, like, on job site boards, and in, so this is in London. And the difference between, say, like, an entry-level web designer and UX designer is, like, 10 grand. I was like, but they're going to the same courses, doing the same thing. How is that even possible? Um, I think that's changed quite a bit. Like, mm -hmm. so universities and like are, are accommodating to this UX. Uh, so the best, uh, the way I look at it is the portfolio. A web designer, a typical web design portfolio is a bunch of thumbnails with a finished website. Right. Um, a typical UX design portfolio would be, this was the project, this is how long I had, this is what I worked on specifically, and this is the actual process I took to the end result. So almost like the end result isn't that important, it's what were the steps to someone doing stuff, some user research, maybe some usability testing, maybe writing stuff on stickies. So you see like, I mean, it's coming a bit cliche, but like you see like, a picture of a board with lots of sticky paper. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then like the wireframes and the steps and the flow. But for a UX designer, you really want to understand how someone actually thinks uh, and what, how they actually come to the process. Because we all know like projects, really large projects, it's not one person. Um, I know as the artist designer, we like to think as being like the supreme person who creates everything. but. Um, it's usually like a team of people, but it's hard to see that from someone's portfolio. So actually right. seeing like someone did and saying like, and also what went wrong? That's a really powerful question. It's like, um, you, you get that in a lot of interviews, like say, what what did, what happened that went badly and how did you solve it? Because we all have like the, you know, nightmare stories. We don't talk about them, but they're the things which actually teach you a lot about what a person does when they're in um, like a challenge, uh, because it happens to all of us. So that's, that's the kind of things that you really look for in a UX portfolio, I think. Okay. Right. Would you say? Uh, let me, can I just ask a few more questions about this? So from what I just heard, somebody is a web designer, it's actually pretty easy to ascertain whether or not they're a good fit. You can see the thumbnails, the finished work. It's pretty easy, like this is a good fit. They have good sense of design, typography, things are legible, things make a lot of sense visually. But in order to hire a UX person, it sounds to me like you have to spend a god awful amount of time going through their process and understanding the problem because that's the context for you to understand what it is that they're producing, right? So whereas I can look at a web designer portfolio in five minutes and determine this is a good fit or not, a yay or an a, a UX person, I imagine I'd have to spend a lot of time or is it after you look at these things for a while, you can also come to a pretty quick conclusion as to their good fit they know what they're doing or they do not know what they're doing yeah i think you can like looking at the person's portfolio you can clearly see if someone's just copy and pasting the same sort of things um i suppose it's like more in the storytelling becomes a big thing with ux mm. it's also like so at, the, at google we have like three types of ux designer you have like the kind of ux, UX designers designing the flow the wireframes uh, then you have like the visual designer who's more like the web designer so they'll be designing the ui and um, the graphics as it were um, so from that type of UX designer, you probably will be um, looking more at the f final thing and the actual the, the visual quality of it. Um, and the others are like a motion designer, which is more like you know uh, using After Effects. But yeah, and I think it you you can it does take a bit more time like to look at a UX designer's portfolio properly. You can't just like skim over. Um, you do have to kind of invest in it. Um, but that I mean because of the kind of role, it, it, that's quite, quite like part and parcel of like you know hiring someone from the UX world, I guess. Mm -hmm. Ryan, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think Mustafa kind of hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. um, he also has a lot more like you know experience looking at portfolios than I do. So I think his summary was pretty spot on. Perfect. Okay. Um, I think that was pretty clear. Matthew, are you reading the comments? Because I can't stay engaged, write notes, and actually read yeah. comments. This is too heady for me. Yeah, there, there's tons of comments, but there's one question on here that um, I wanted to bring up since it's related to the portfolio. Um, uh, hopefully I say this right. Na Nanya, Nanya or Nanya was uh, 
asking, what are the typical deliverables for a UX designer? Uh, so usually, <clears throat> um, firstly, it's like you're looking at the problem, right? And it's like make, sometimes, I think all designers really do this, is you might reevaluate the design brief that's been given to you um, to make sure that the assumptions that are in it is actually true. So the first thing you might do is like re, re, rewrite the design brief. Um, from there, you might do look at the research that's been done um, and then maybe do your own research to really understand what the actual field is. Because as designers, we're not necessarily experts in the field that we're designing for. So if like you're designing a fashion website, you may know nothing about fashion um, or even like you know an anthropologist website or whatever. So the first thing you want to try and get in, into the actual um, mode of what it is that you're designing for so you can start building up empath empathy for the actual audience and from there you start building up personas so you may do um user interviews with people to really understand the type of people you're designing for and try and tease out what is the things that they are trying to do that they can't do um so like there's this common quote uh, that's often attributed to like henry ford uh, it wasn't there's no proof that he said this but it's like, if, if i asked people what they wanted they would have said faster horses and this is like often used as a mantra saying, never ask the users, the users do right. it, which is, I think it's completely wrong. I, I, what I really think is you can pull from that is, um, is when you ask someone something in a user interview, they often speak in analog and we speak in digital. So they're saying faster horses, because that's the only way they can articulate what they're trying to say is, I want to go faster. So as a UX designer, you're basically trying to understand what people are trying to do and the way they articulate it will be like in the analog. Um, and then once you start seeing like common themes, think, okay, right, how do we design for this actual problem that people are having? And from there, you might start doing wireframes, um, you iterate, create like prototypes with like Envision or like Marvel app or something equivalent. And then you start testing it to see like, does this flow make sense? Um, and then from there, then you might start working with a visual designer, start looking at the UI to make it like really nice and conceptual and then, you know, it's an ongoing process thereafter. Yeah, the, the, t the, the tail end of that, I would, I think that that process overview is spot on. The one thing that I think my team uh, used to focus a lot on was actually the testing, right? The results, you know, running A-B tests to see, you know, if a feature would um, ultimately lead to like, you know, more conversions. So like imagine like the future website, when you go on the mobile site, the call to action button is above the fold, which means it loads in the first viewport. If you had that call to action button like tucked away and hidden, there's way less people that are ultimately going to take action on what you want them to do. So that's why like one of the best practices that you know we we would advocate that's you know fairly straightforward and obvious at times is that you know have a clear call to action above the fold and a clear value prop of what separates you, um, what is your business, what do, how do you um, what do you do better than everyone else? Mm -hmm. So I think those are just like two small tips because I can't tell you how often when I'm browsing on the mobile web that you know the call to action buttons are three or four scrolls down and that's really why you're probably seeing a drop off in uh, you know click through rate and ultimately more users are probably bouncing. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I wanted to follow up on, on that. I think those were both great breakdowns. I think our audience, because half of the audience at least are graphic designers and they're so used to deliverables, you know, here's a logo, here's a brand strategy wow. uh, document or things like that. Like they're, they're looking for tangible things. So uh, a lot of what you had mentioned early on in terms of the research personas, um, the hypothesis of what you might create, the testing and results, is there some kind of physical document or way? How do you present that information to stakeholders or people that it matters to? So, like, we have a thing called a design sprint. I don't know if you are familiar mm -hmm. with it. It's like, it's like our five, we call it five phases, but five steps mm -hmm. or things that you can actually do. Um, I find, like, the approach which I used to do as a graphic designer, so I, I, I'm guilty of this, is kind of the over-the-wall approach. Design something, throw it to the client, and maybe they like it, maybe they don't. Um, but with the design sprint approach, and what UX design should do is to take the client with you on the journey of creating something. That way, they have an understanding of what their users want, um, and they have kind of like an emotional investment in the thing that you're creating as well. And it doesn't become this very harsh. Um, here's a blank page, and finally a final design. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you still like if you can't do that in a relationship, you still will have like. Um, a wireframe mock, you will explain to them what you're trying to do, trying to test, getting ideas, getting the feature sets that they're trying to build with them. Um, so the tangible things you might create is like a, a wireframe prototype in in, uh, in Vision, um, or maybe some re mid fidelity designs just to get the idea of how the look and feel of the product that you're creating, how it's going. Um, 
but yeah, but ideally you want to kind of be working with them in the process rather than it being at the end. Because right. uh, it, it becomes really painful because designing a step and flow can take quite a lot of time. Right. Um, I mean, and obviously, you know, doing a logo does, but it can be very tedious as well, like doing that. Mm-hmm. These things, so you kind of want to get buy-in way soon, sooner, in, and have that more um, connective involvement. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it sounds like all of the information that you present is represented in the wireframes or low fidelity mockups. You don't, you guys don't have any formalized process of presenting the information and findings um, as a deliverable uh, that something somebody can see or review. So you- I mean, you could possibly do something as a presentation deck where you actually go through. So if, if the client's not visible when you're doing all your research, you'll mm-hmm. go through every step. Like, so we interviewed, for example, we interviewed 10 people, and um, this is what we were trying to tease from them. These were the questions that we asked. You might do a couple of quotes. This is like, you know, things mm-hmm. that they said which were pain points. Um, so you might break down an interview into discovery and then like uh, presenting the thing that you may propose, like the design to the actual people that you're interviewing. And then you take snippets from that and you put it into like a slide deck. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you do like a bunch of recommendations. You might do some strategy stuff, say like, this is what we think would be good for the project going forward. And then it's up to the client to basically decide um, to take it or leave it really. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you may present, the deliverable may be like a slide deck in that sense, basically Mm -hmm. trying to condense the whole process, research, stickies, wireframes, um, and then your proposal in that sense. Right. I think from what I'm getting here is that the process, the framework of doing a design sprint isn't inherently beautiful necessarily unless you love stickies and scrawled notes and red dots on things as people are voting. But as a graphic designer, you can summarize that and you can make it beautiful and presentable in a keynote deck that has a nice flow to the story. So you're presenting the summary, the documents, the learnings, if you will, and the assumptions that are made and challenged and proven through your testing. You could document it that way, right? And you can make it look really nice. Yeah, no, I mean, ideally the thing that you're testing, I mean, when you're making a prototype, because at, at the end of a design sprint, you test with, like we say, five people. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're prototyping, you want to make the prototype be as believable as possible. So you try to make it look um, like the worst thing is to put like a black and white thing in front of someone because they're going to think it's broken. I mean, that's most people are supposed to say, why are these boxes gray? So you try to make it visually um, look complete so it's, they, they're not focused on uh, the fact that it's a prototype. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to presenting something, you know, the you know, design is all about presentation. So mm-hmm. you can put some effort into that. Is that what do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really have much more to to add there. But I think, Chris, your summary of like having the you know the envision deck or whatever at the end to summarize all the main takeaways, that's that's super valuable. Um, I think one of the other things that we haven't touched on yet is the importance of you know cross functional buy in whenever you're doing anything web related. So many times it's just like you know designers are done with what they're doing, they throw it over the fence to the you know the engineers, the engineers start building it. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of due diligence that should have happened from the designer. Like the designer should have thought, you know, um, thoughtfully about like how they're exporting images, for example. If you're sending a developer, you know, three or four megabyte images, that could take an additional three or four seconds to load um, when a user is browsing. So uh, one of the things that, you know, we definitely always recommend is getting cross-functional buy-in from different stakeholders to make sure that all of their perspectives are are heard and they all also set cross-functional goals where it's not just like the one unicorn that's doing all the work. It's really a, a company-wide buy-in. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Okay. I think we're we, that was pretty clear and, and pretty in-depth. Maybe we can move on to some of the other things that you had sent over to me in the outline in terms of sure. what else to talk about. Let's get into the web design trends. I think you bucketed under three things, instant, helpful, and capable. Why don't we start with instant? Like, What does that mean? What are you noticing? Can you tell us some of what you've observed? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll give like a general overview of what we mean by that. So instant is like, you know, are you loading a high quality first experience and a consistent experience throughout? So performance is one of the most important factors of building a successful mobile website and website. So, you know, faster speed ultimately will lead to, will accentuate good design. So I think I I really, I'll, I'll let Mustafa jump because I think his description of skeleton screens and how he's used those to improve user perception is super interesting. And then I can talk a little bit more about like what are specific trends to improve, um, you know, your first impression when someone comes to your mm-hmm. website for the first time. Okay. So like, um, I think the best way to start this is with a story, because <laughs> I love telling stories. Um, so like Houston Airport had a really big problem with uh, 
uh, passengers complaining about how long it took for their luggage to arrive. So they get off the plane, um, they get to the terminal really quickly, and then they'll be waiting ages. So Houston Airport like invested millions, training people, like updating technology to make uh, the process like seven minutes long, and people still complained. So what they did was they parked the planes further away from the terminal, oh. and suddenly complaints, complaints dropped to zero. Right, so, it's, like, it's, <laughs> so, so the concept is like, how do you occupy people's time? Because it's like still seven minute block, right, of time. Um, but because like five minutes of time is a person walking to the terminal, as soon as they get there, two minutes later, oh, there's my suitcase. That was really quick, as opposed to getting there one minute sooner. So it's like, how do you take this in a conceptual level um, in UX? So it's like, some the worst thing you can possibly do to, to a user is show them a blank screen when the website's loading. Um, and like the second worst thing is a spinner because basically the user has no context of how long something's taking to load. So then we say like if you do skeleton screens like and these little nice loading devices, you show like metadata to give the user an idea that something what something's actually coming. So maybe like article title, you might be like tee something away um, and basically give them context. And so you're like parking the plane further away from the terminal so that each one of these things is distracting them long enough for the site to actually load. Um, so that's what we uh, we talk about hacking user perception uh, and all the small little de design devices that you can do um, to do that. Those mother effers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Houston, so I'm just like thinking back to like, my airport experience. It's a pretty long walk. <laughs> now you know. Yeah. That's so it's interesting about perception <laughs> there. So how do you, how do you do that in the real world where? Can you give me some more concrete examples? Like, what's the equivalent if you can't make the site load faster when you talk about the skeleton screens to give context? Like, what else can you do? Uh, so there's, um, so uh, I'm just thinking aloud. Right, uh, navigation front and center. So that basically the stuff that Ryan spoke about. Like, Facebook found that um, if, when they moved their navigation from a hamburger menu, like the thing in the top left-hand corner, mm -hmm. to like just having like a bottom navigation, uh, there was this perceived speed increase because someone going tap button and then tap to the section that they want feels much slower than someone just seeing the button and tapping. So that's another small thing that you can mm -hmm. actually do. Um, and it's things like that, uh, how you lay out stuff, information hierarchy. Like the number one priority of users, when you ask them, like, what's the number one thing, they always say speed. So showing them the most, most important information first. Like if you go to any, say, like a university website, uh, for any college or whatever, all of the information that you would want as a student or as a visitor is never present. It's all pictures of people on canvas, like, you know, uh, having fun, you know, high-fiving each other, but, like, the address, when the course dates are, when the term times are, you never find that information. So, like, another thing is always surface the actual information and content that you want. So these are, like, small different things that you can do to hack. Um, another thing is, like, the way you stagger animation. Like, if you if that animation or transition starts slow and builds up fast, it feels faster because of that kind of anticipation. Um, there's like a research study that was done that uh, loading bars that animate, you know, when you have in the old uh, OSS, OS mm. X, uh, it's like had this an, uh, loading bars which had this like like a uh, thing that would load to the left. They right. feel faster than ones that animate to the right. So small, the, all these small weird things um, combined together can make an experience feel much faster. Nice. That was actually very actionable. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I've got like a talk I give on this, like, on you. So I'm sure, again, I'm plugging my stuff. Let's do it. What, what is your YouTube <laughs> channel? So everybody can check it out right now. Well, I do stuff on like um, Chrome Developers YouTube channel. But if you search my name, which most people probably won't be able to spell. Uh, um, but uh, so like uh, hacked user perception is a talk which I gave recently. Um, but I mean, we can share that after, I guess. Well, here's yeah. the spelling. Here's how you spell Mustafa's name. I'm not going to try and say it again and butcher it. Jonah, thank you very much. So search for Mustafa Kurtulda. Kurtulda. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I was close. Thank you. You're very kind. So if you search for him on YouTube, I'm sure you can find all his videos. Because yeah, that's you... ultimately how you got to Google, right? As a as a public speaker by night, your, your day job, your night job. They saw that you're an advocate and then they brought you in. Yeah, no, I mean, the thing is with Google, so people say, how do I get a job at Google? And I yeah. think number one thing is like passion. And I used to do this on my own, mm -hmm. like really obsessively because I have no social life. <laughs> um, <laughs> and But it's like how we, I mean, how we get to these positions, right? You just love doing it and you just keep, and so they see that and it's like, okay, we want you to do this for us. Um, so yeah, pretty much. Okay. So is there anything else about being instant that you want to add to this, Ryan? Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on it. That's okay. the first piece. Um, you know, I have a general theme of like focused on first impressions. 
And there's like two stats that I think are interesting. I don't want to like throw a lot of data at everyone, but I do think it's important to kind of set user expectations. Users, especially mobile users, are more impatient than ever. So we have a very short amount of time to convey what your company does or, you know, what your what product or brand or whatever you're trying to do um, in, a, in a timely fashion. So there was actually a study done that it only takes 50 milliseconds to form a first impression. So that's really important. And then the second piece of that is 88% of online consumers are less likely to return to a site that has a bad user experience. So that's why like, I'm always saying like, you really need to care about and have empathy for all of those first time users. That's why skeleton screens is one way to keep them you know, interested and engaged so that they can continue along. So like, you know, part of this you know, uh, topic is trends. I don't know that this is a trend, but it's something that you'll see in a lot of high quality sites is creative copywriting. So you know, as designers, we you know, rightfully spend a ton of time focused on aesthetics. A well-designed copy is like part of your branding. It mm -hmm. should, you know, it, you should be able to use it to tell a concise story. So, like when I was, you know, looking at the future, and Chris said it was cool if I, I give feedback on their site before, so everyone knows, <laughs> not just me, it's not just me giving them a hard time. But all right, uh, future, hold on, uh, let me take off my. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm ready for the spanking. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean it's all. I actually have more positive feedback okay. than anything. But the title, you know, "Welcome to the Future," the copy, uh, they have a value prop above the fold, like I was mentioning previously content, courses, and tools. I know why I'm there immediately. And then the call to action also above the fold is like, what do you want me to actually do now that I'm on the site? So in a moment's glance, I have a good, I have a good idea of like, you know, you know what, the, what the future does and what they want me to do. So then as a user, I can determine, is this meeting my goals? And more likely than not, it probably is based off of like how you came to the site in the first place. So um, yeah, the one the one tidbit here is like creative copywriting, I think is really important. Um, I think as designers, everyone can get better at this. I do think it's a, absolutely a collaborative effort. I've heard the future other, you know, uh, brand strategists talk a lot about this. and I, I, I totally agree with a lot of the points um, that have been brought up. Another like, I guess, like trend that's related to this on like first impressions is, you know, thoughtful color schemes. So like the right color can improve readership because, you know, making messages easier or more visually appearant, appealing. So like there's a lot of tests that are done by like, you know, changing out, um, you know, call to, like the call to action button from one color to another. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's one example of like where we, we've seen this in the past. And you're not supposed to do that, right? No, no. I mean, it's it's like there. So you can uh, I guess the example would be like you have a yellow call to action button, but you have white text. So the user can't see. Oh, it, I right? see. I see what you're saying. So you want to be contrast. thoughtful on yeah the contrast. You want to be thoughtful that it's actually accentuating the user experience. And if you know you want to be thinking about all users. So if someone's colorblind and they come on the site, they'll be able to understand that you know what the call to action is, regardless of the color scheme. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are those are the two main ones on focus and first impression. And then I did want to give one last tidbit for any developers. I, I know that a lot of designers don't care much, as much about this, but. You know, setting a performance budget is the same thing as like setting a financial budget where you want to make sure that you're um, setting restrictions on how much stuff there is on your site. So like how much, you know, HTML, how much JavaScript, how much CSS, how many images. And yeah. then there's three metrics in particular that I like to point people to. Okay. First, contentful paint, which is, you know, um, is it useful? You know, this is like how long does it take for that first bite to cut, you know, fire and like give the user something visual. Your speed index, which shows you know how long does it take all the visual elements above the fold to render, and then time to interactive, in my opinion, is like one of the most important, which is it measures when does the page actually become interactive. You know, when can I hit the search bar? When can I click? You know, shop now. So, um, first contentful paint, speed index, and time to interactive, I think, are three really good metrics to think about when you're trying to improve, you know, your your site's performance. What was the first one? You said it so fast. I'm like, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's first contentful paint, FCP. First. Contentful pain point? Paint. Paint. Yeah. Another way to think of it is first meaningful paint. But if you just Google like um, first contentful paint, um, that'll that'll come up. Okay. So basically so, it's like when something hits basically it's shown on screen, because like how long it takes for something to be visibly visible when you go to a website. Okay. Great. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm just searching how to spell it. I'm like, there it is. I found how to spell it. Keynote was like, you, you don't know how to spell. I'm like, yes, yes, I do. I know how to spell that. Dude, come on. I got this. All right. Thanks, Jonah. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. Jonah cut away from that so I can show my deck again. Let me see what we're looking at. The next thing is, in terms of trends, helpful. So can, can you guys jump into that? Uh, yeah, uh, I think Ryan's just getting a charger. I think his laptop's yeah, oh, Okay, something happened. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first, and then I gotta grab one. Of course, this okay. room I'm in doesn't have one. But um, yeah, so helpful is another really important bucket. And just the the three that we're going to be talking about, we mm -hmm. just went over being fast. Helpful is like how can you make it easier for users to get things done, and then capable is like how do you make your experience worth coming back to. So right now we're on the second piece of this, which is you know, having integrations and a simple UI to help people get things done. So a trend or things that we see more and more, regardless of the industry, are, you know, using things that automate processes, such as designers can build in autofills, autocomplete, and you can use express checkouts, such as Google Pay. Because how many times have we been on, you know, a mobile checkout flow where we have to manually tap in with our, you know, 14 different fields? Yeah. So and you can take, you know, 14 steps in a process and have it be one or two clicks. You know, being thoughtful about integrations is like a really uh, a great trend that's been happening for a while, and you'll you'll start to see it more and more um, across the web. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll, I'll start with that one, and then I'll, I'll kick it over to Mustafa. To, I think he has some good points on a, a recognizable uh, UI, so making a seamless UI throughout the, the web experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, just to sort of jump on what Ryan was saying, it's like we say use the platform as much as possible. I think as designers, we have this instinct thing to design everything custom. Um, and I think when it comes to actually implementing stuff from an engineering side, it becomes really difficult, especially now that accessibility is such an important thing. Um, like just implementing custom made things is really, really difficult. Uh, and also you want to make sure that you have a consistent experience across multiple browsers, like using the platform. So like we have like payments UI where you can um, press a button and it will automatically like load someone's credit card details or like auto fill stuff. So I say use the platform as much as possible again, because that you have the speed, um, uh, element there as well. Um, and yeah, so I mean like recognizable UI, <clears throat> it's kind of, me and Ryan were trying to push this as like a new trend because <laughs> it seems like when it comes to like the thought leaders in the industry, it's like a, there's a gold rush of who can come up with a new term and then maybe write a book about it. Or right. <laughs> If there's any publishers out there, um, so like recognizable UI for me is like how you can make, I mean, it's like it does make things seem as obvious as possible. Um, mm. So we know from like as a visual designer, someone who was like, you know, from that world, uh, I like designs which are really simplistic, especially like the Japanese design where it's like a lot of iconography. But we know from research that the moment you use icons, you leave down stuff to um, interpretation, people are going to get the wrong interpretation. Mm. Uh, so you want to make things as recognizable as possible. So we say always use like icons and a text label as much as possible, which um, I really feel for the German designers because their words are like a mile long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to say like UI, it becomes really difficult for them. But you know, um, we will say try to make the thing as obvious as possible. Um, it's acceptable if the design you're doing is like for a band where you're trying to make the person find the thing that they're looking for. But if you're doing like pure information design for an e-commerce site um, or for something which is like a service, you really want to make the experience as, uh, as blatant as possible. There's no like, um, again, that really comes down to the UX versus des uh, web designer thing again. It's like web designer wants to make something visually beautiful. UX designer wants to make the experience as seamless as possible. Um, so we say like make things uh, as um, recognizable as possible. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, I, I was caught. I was caught reading some of the comments to make sure our audience is keeping up with us to see how they're reacting to this. But I think we should continue to move ahead. So the third thing: Are we ready to move on to the third point in trends? Yeah, sure. I honestly, Ryan, do you want to add anything else to um, uh, helpful? No, I think those are those are two of the biggest things that I, I wanted to focus on. Cool. Um, yeah, the last one is kind of what Mustafa and I have most recently collaborated on, and mm -hmm. that's this idea of building a progressive web app. So just a general overview, um, progressive web app is an application that, that takes the latest technologies to combine the best of the web um, and mobile. So think of, it, think of it as like a website that is built using technologies to make it feel more like an app. So you can do basically things like um, on a technical side, which is like build service workers and 
you, you can leverage the cache and use push APIs, but what you're actually doing is delivering a richer experience that feels like that if you like switched over from a native app. So this will enable things like, you know, add to home screen. So if you if you use mm. the future if you use the future a lot, you could use this technology to add a home screen button, so someone could frequent the site and I basically have it added to their, um, you know, their mobile background or their mobile desktop. It also allows things for like push notifications. So if you're a big fan of the future and you're subscribed to the future website, you can get a push notification anytime you know a new live stream or video is posted. So, um, but the real core of it is to be build a website that's reliable, fast, and engaging. So very similar to what we were talking about prior, but um, I'll let Mustafa kind of jump more into the weeds, but that's just like, you know, high level view of what a progressive web app actually is. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we, we're kind of um, tainted by the term when we say app uh, in, in PWA, because it kind of makes it feel like a new thing. A progressive web app is still a website. It's just with, like you're, you're trying to utilize the features of hardware that you never we never had as web designers before. So like the accelerometer, the camera, location. Like So when you're designing your experience, you're thinking, how, what other things can we use? Like say if you're designing um, something for a restaurant and someone wants to make an order, you might have a thing where you, like you're close by, press this button, and we can see how long it'll take for a food to be delivered to you, but, you know, like Uber Eats or whatever. So it gives all these like powerful things um, that, web designers never had access to, but it's still a website. Um, so we say you're still designing for a site. <clears throat> I mean, there's a few considerations when you're designing a PWA, um, but because you can fake install the website on, on someone's screen, you have to then realize that in designing the experience, you have to make it feel as much like a native application as possible because you're competing in like, the native world. Um, so when it comes to designing animation, motion, stuff like that, you really need to invest a lot of time and energy in that. Um, across platform with web designers, like every platform is different. So the icon that you design for Android is different to iOS, is different to Windows. So you have to take those things into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've written quite a lot about um, progressive web apps. So I say I think in the description of the video, there should be a link to the ebook, which goes into some of the more technical things in a lot more detail. Um, but yeah, I would say you don't, you want to forget a responsive web design that's still a part of it. It's just you have more features, more access to the devices that we're designing for now. Mm. That's really interesting. And is this idea or desire to make things feel more like an app because apps are you're designed in a way that they realize you have a limited amount of time and screen real estate. And so it's like the most optimized version of an experience and we can learn from that. And well, well, I mean, I think that's definitely it. And I think if you think about it, whole, if you have one holistic approach, mm -hmm. you can also be much more agile, right? right. If you have one one you know progressive web app or one solution that works across all devices, that you you can be much more you can roll out features faster and you can also fix things at a faster rate. So that's I think that's really exciting for web development teams to think about, and that's why I think you know as a web trend that adoption adoption of you know prioritizing PWAs is going to continue. Mm. I, so I have another question on this, and it's it's sort of related, but I'd love to get your insight and perspective on this. Is that why are the mobile experiences from some of my favorite apps different than desktop. It feels as if either two teams are developing it or they're artificially crippling the desktop experience so that they force you to use the mobile version. Uh, well, I would say, let me, why do you feel that way? So I'm going to UX mode where I'm actually... <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so it's going to get real meta, okay? So for example, on Facebook, when I'm on the desktop and I want to post a text with a background, I have a finite choice of number of backgrounds that I can use, whereas my mobile app has all the options for backgrounds. I could choose colors or, or patterns and textures. That's just one of the things that's obvious to me, that there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between this and that. Instagram is another infamous one where it's a heavily crippled desktop experience. So there may be two things that play there. I mean, the first one is like um, mobile is becoming much more prominent right. on the web. And like mobile uses, and we know like what we call the next billion users, which is people say like in Asia and Africa coming online, they're starting from mobile. Right. So for companies, it's like if you're going to invest um, into developing something, mobile is like the default, right? So there may be that at play. Um, the other thing is, it's like when people coming to design, say they say mobile first, they focus on the mobile experience and make sure that you have the most optimal experience in that screen. Um, so it may actually be the case that because you're being forced to make decisions quicker on mobile, mm -hmm. that it feels like a much more um, concrete experience as opposed to on desktop, because the real estate is there, everything is thrown out. 
like, and you see everything, and maybe it's been too much of an overwhelmed experience. So I say, like, if you're trying to book a, a plane ticket, go to the mobile experience and go to the desktop. It's so much easier to do on the mobile because right. they have to get rid of everything, like the ones which are designed well. So because it's like you're not being like these are the latest sales. Have you signed up for an account? Whatever. No, you just want to look at looking at plane tickets. Um, so there may be one of those two things at play. I'd say there. So if the mobile experience is so great and and it's creating a great user experience, this is the question: Why f it up on the desktop? Why not do the same so that I'm not frustrated? And you're absolutely right. Whenever I log onto these airline, the web page is like I don't even know where to begin. This is like just it's too much. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I mean, it's hard to really. <laughs> why do teams do whatever they do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think it may be a case of investment. We've been pushing mobile for so long, um, and I think we've been designing in mobile screens. And it's really hard to design responsive, not responsive, well, and, and responsibly, I suppose, but because the tools are so restrictive. It's like there isn't that many design tools where you can design mobile and then stretch it, and then you can start focusing on um, desktop. I mean, there's some plugins in Sketch which kind of hack that feel, but mm -hmm. our tools are very restrictive. So. Um, you put so much effort into designing this mobile experience. Uh, like in the beginning of the day, you may spend three, three hours on it, and then you've got like one hour left in the end of the day. Oh God! Let me just quickly expand things and just chuck it in and leave it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what's happening behind the scenes right now. Because it's like you've got to, you know, your boss is saying, right, you, we have to do the next one. Right. Uh, there may be an element of that, you know, because like we're human beings as well, right? Um, do you, you think it's strategic at some point that we want to drive mobile app? adoption that the experience is rich on mobile and it's horrible on desktop well i don't think i don't think anyone would really advocate directly for that mm -hmm. <laughs> um but yeah no i mean we see so, sometimes we see the opposite as well people focus so much on desktop that they've forgotten about mobile right um again i think with anything any team's got a finite number of resources and they're going to look at where most of their audience is coming from and if it's from one platform to the other that's what they're going to focus on um and that just seems to be the case at the moment. Perfect. So, Thank yeah. you. Anything else you want to add to this, Ryan? No, I, uh, I, I think we hit the nail on the head in terms of like PWA overview. I don't mm -hmm. want to lose my graphic designer friends listening because it can get technical pretty quick. But mm -hmm. my, my, the TLDR here is look into it. Um, I think as a designer, there's, um, I think a lot of developers talk about the value. But from a design perspective, it is a very engaging. It's very easy to bring users back. And you can, for users that um, have a really good experience, you can give the option to like, you know, add to home screen so they can re-engage at a later date. So rather than just having, you know, a first time user, you can start to think about more return users um, and being more thoughtful in doing so. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the, the main thing is like, don't get overwhelmed by it. I think it's just uh, good to have a general overview and you're, I think you're gonna continue to see, you know, more and more websites uh, pop up. Um, and if you want like an example, like at the Chrome uh, Dev Summit last year, uh, my team actually presented like uh, with, uh, I mean, Spotify presented, but um, Spotify saw like, you know, from moving over to a PWA on their web app, they saw, you know, 54% increase in day one place. So obviously for a music company, that's huge. And then, um, you know, 14% increase in 60 day active users. So they had more activity. They had, they had business goals set when they did this. And then they ultimately saw success after rolling it out. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have probably used the web, you know, the application. So a lot of the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is you're probably using PWAs all the time and you just don't realize it. I don't know if Mustafa, you have any other favorite PWAs that people could just probably use on a daily basis that they're not. Uh, like Twitter is like Twitter Lite is the really big one that I've seen and they've yeah. put a lot of time and energy in investing and making the experience app like to the point where you don't even have to open the app anymore. You can just use the website, install the website, um, and you have all of the features that you will have, uh, all the ones that you really need on native. Um, right. Starbucks, I think, is another one who's done some interesting stuff. The Financial Times. Um, <clears throat> Trivago. I don't know if you have Trivago in the States. I'm sure yeah, you we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, their, their experience is amazing. Like, what they did was, if, um, if the internet connectivity dies when you're trying to look for a hotel, uh, instead of having this notification say, don't worry, your internet connection will come back, they actually show a game. You know, like those games where it's like a, a little ball in a maze and you have to get it through like, oh, so they're, they're reassuring the user that um, don't worry, the experience, your state is saved. Just play this game until the network comes back. Uh, and they found like 67% of users continued with the experience just by showing them this fun little game, um, which is a hard thing to pitch to your boss. You know, I want to design a game. <laughs> but I mean, it's like these experiences and stuff, like doing these fun, delightful things, um, it just makes 
our job as designers much more interesting rather than logo, header, title, link, right. sidebar, footer. You know, like we actually can start doing some really cool interactive things. Um, uh, and so, like PWAs offer like all these different like, opportunities. Mm -hmm. This has been super, super dense and helpful and eye opening, and you got me spinning in my mind in terms of like, what are we doing? How are we using the PWA approach? Well, I even know that as an acronym prior to today, so this is fantastic. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> I'll be going around. Yeah, you guys, you know, there's not a PWA experience. experience. Let's think about this, guys. All right, that's what I'll, you guys will have to deal with. Just me being a jerk about things like this, Matthew. Uh, I know we've we've taken a lot of time to get to this point, but I'm just wondering if there are a handful of questions, maybe one or two, we can lob to Mustafa or Ryan for them to address in the comment section. Yeah, I think there was one question mm -hmm. both from uh, David and uh, Nine, yeah. I'm gonna try and co combine okay. the two. And uh, they had a question about uh, data and user research and how that feeds into your guys' process. Because I think we haven't gone in, like how do you acquire user data? How do you use that data to inform what it is that you do? And I, I think you you high level talk about this, but maybe if you could might outline some more of a practical approach of where you might get that data and then how you use that. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, go ahead, Mustafa. I don't mind. You want to go first? I'll go second. <laughs> Uh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, like my, in my opinion, like my background is mostly just using Google Analytics. So obviously Google Analytics shows how a user interacts with a particular site. And then you can kind of make determinations based off of like, um, you know, the analytics will be able to tell you that, um, you know, a user dropped off at the checkout because there was 14 steps. And then <laughs> after you roll out a, you know, a single, you know, an express pay solution like Google Pay, you can expedite that process and you go from 14 step, you know, 14 clicks to two clicks. Mm -hmm. So that's like a very easy way. I mean, the other, I mean, and there's, I mean, there's tons of, you know, obviously analytics companies out there for web analytics, but um, that's the main, that's where most people start is by looking at, um, there's another tool called um, uh, Data Studio. So I have a Medium article that I actually link to a dashboard that um, as long as you have like, you know, access to your company's um, Google Analytics account, it'll uh, thoughtfully populate you know, things like what are the top um, landing pages and then, you know, which pages have the highest bounce rate. So typically when you're, if you're thinking, if you've limited resources, it's also thinking about um, how can you, how can you thoughtfully uh, prioritize resources by saying, all right, this is a very popular page, but a lot of people are leaving it. So that's like where I would typically start mm -hmm. dev efforts is to say like, hey, let's redesign this entry point to start. And then mm -hmm. we can slowly start to follow the best practices throughout the rest of the site. So the short answer is, um, I used, uh, for, I've always been using, even before Google, Google Analytics has kind of been my bread and butter. What about you, Mustafa? Um, so, like, practical things you can do, like, w what we say is we don't say we're um, data-driven, we say we're data-informed. So you're looking at um, the information, again, people are trying to make, like, a, uh, a good case of what to do next. So the first thing you can do is user interviews. So if you're trying to figure out what problems you're trying to solve, um, organizing maybe 10 people and, and having conversations with, with them um, and making sure that like two-thirds of the time you're listening so there's like a technique that we say like designers we love to talk and we just keep talking and talking and talking you know uh, that's just like our thing but so when you're trying to be like the research it's really hard so there's this technique that lawyers use where they'll ask you a question and then they'll count to five because like you in, you incriminate yourself when you with silence right so it's like you're trying to make the person fill the um, the void so you say all right uh, if you're trying, so like so you're designing a ride-sharing app, so like how do you go to work in the morning? Like what's the travel? What's what's the um, the things that you do? And then you're trying to tease out the pain points, like what, trying to find out like, what's the patterns of things which are really difficult. And then you might ask like a really open-ended question, like if you had a magic wand, what would you do? What what would be the perfect thing for you for your experience? And then once you've got to that part, you're getting like as much user information, what the pain point is. You're getting the personas. You're writing them down. You're trying to collect. Um, the type of person you're designing for, then you might start working on a prototype, like in a, like a, the ideal flow. And once you have that, you go back to the people and then you test it with them. So um, the first thing you do is you set up a usability test. You may um, you, you do you introduce this is what we're testing for. This is what we're, we're trying to figure out. And then you say, okay, here's my tasks. So if you're designing like a website to buy coffee, I don't know. Um, you say, right, try buy a coffee, try pick a coffee, try send the coffee to someone. And then you, you observe the task that they're actually doing. And then if they fail miserably or they succeed, at the end you start asking them like the personal questions, what did you like, what didn't you like? 
what made sense? What would you do to improve it? Um, is this something that you will use? And then from that data, you can start seeing whether the product you're designing or the flow you're, you're making um, is actually useful or not. And then you just iterate. So like UX designs all the iterations, like uh, every small thing that you learn, you might improve on the prototype, and the next person you test with, um, uh, you show the improved thing. So those are like some of the techniques. Um, I also noticed someone in the comments said about design sprints. So we've got like a design sprint website, which is this design sprint kit dot with google.com or like if you search for it on Google and that has all of like the design techniques um, or like design thinking is quite fashionable now uh, which is basically all the stuff you learn in design college but broken down into small little exercises so there's also like user research type exercises that you can do um, so I would recommend checking that out if you want to learn more about say user research or some of the techniques that you can to find out stuff yeah, I think the other one that I would, other resource just on kind of my point, which was, th there's two different approaches, right? You can go quantitative or more qualitative. I think we both kind of explained both options. Um, the other resources, which we'll, I'm sure we'll add to the, the notes, um, it's winonmobile.withgoogle.com. Um, that's just like basically an overview of what our, you know, mobile process looks like. So a lot of what I talked about today, um, you know, goes through each of these steps in detail with a video and some like best practices. So I, I definitely recommend checking that out as well. Awesome. Great resources to share. You don't even have to be that smart. I just start typing design sprint and then the rest of it fills in automatically for me. That's no, how it works. There. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Those Google guys, they figure out everything. <laughs> Matthew, do we have one more question? I'm, I'm getting kind of hangry. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hangry myself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you actually answered my next question, which was, where do you get started with UX design? And I think you guys have given a bunch of resources. Is there anything else where um, any other, like maybe accounts to follow or YouTube things or any books that you guys might recommend that we can start adding to our resources here in the notes? Yeah, follow me. <laughs> um, obviously, obviously, obvi follow Mustafa. <laughs> You know, there is a, there is a Skillshare. I, did, I created a, a Skillshare course that's absolutely free. I think you can do it without even sign up for an account. Oh, which really? It's like an hour long course that goes through all of the steps of coming up with an idea, uh, doing wireframes, doing a high fidelity design, and then use it, coming up to like usability testing. So that's like a really basic level. That's what I would recommend checking out. Yep. Um, and you mentioned an ebook, right? That you'll send us a link to. Yeah, there's like the two e ebooks on like PWAs. Mm -hmm. In the description, like the, the video's description, there's like the talk which I gave about hacking user perception. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've, it's like that moment where your mind goes blank. I want to give every single link on the web. <laughs> <laughs> you can send us an email later. We'll update it in the show notes. So you yeah. guys will have that. You can just look. Where's my hand? Right down there somewhere. <laughs> That's where you'll get it. Okay, guys. Well, People are still discovering like there's notes. They're like, where do I find this? We'll just twirl that thing down, and it's all right there. If we, if you can't do that, I don't know how I can help you. Okay, so I think it's about this point in time that I try to do the very daunting task of summarizing every piece of information you've shared with us. So, guys, bear with me. Let's see if I got this right, okay? I was taking notes like an animal, so let's do this. Before we say goodbye to Ryan and Mustafa, let's see what happens here. So we've been talking a lot about UX, and it's a very different thing than the design of the site. So who are the users? What are their challenges? What are the steps the user takes? Design that flow, and then that would progress into doing wireframes and lo-fi mockups, and then doing a lot of A-B testing and iterating, applying what you've learned. And if you're interested in this field and you want to get a job, this is the general structure of what a UX portfolio might look like. This is us defining the problem. This is the project. This is the timeline. This is the process that we took, the framework that we might have used, the research the user research we've conducted, and the usability testing, what went wrong and what did you learn, and the ultimate end results. It looks something like that. And you can make it pretty if you want, but this has to be documented in some way that somebody else can look at and understand your process and how you think. And that's a big difference. Design versus thinking. Okay. Uh, the assumption is that the user's dumb and that's an, an erroneous statement. It's because the user speaks in a, a different language and you need to translate that. They speak in analog, you speak in digital. You have to figure that out. You have to learn to listen to understand what the true problem is so that you can give them an appropriate solution. Uh, some best practices from, from Ryan is always have a clear call to action and make that above the fold. You need to have a clear value prop and to tell people why we're better than everyone else at this one thing. I think we lightly touched into this or touched on this in the design sprint, uh, which is a, 
a, a process that you guys have developed in house. I think there's a book called Design Sprint, or called Sprint from Jake Knapp, who was also a Googler. Five steps, and this is a really strong piece of advice that you guys can use, whether you're doing UX or anything else. Any kind of client interaction, take the client along with you on the journey versus throwing it over the wall and hoping that it works. When you do that, you enroll them in the process and you're less likely to hit that friction point where they're surprised at what you do. So enroll them, enroll them, work with them, not for them. Okay, uh, another point to note is prototypes need to be visually complete, otherwise people feel like it's broken or something is wrong. So that's where your design chops kind of come to play. Uh, another piece of valuable advice is get cross-functional buy-in from different stakeholders with cross-functional goals. There are so many terms and ideas packed in my bullet points here <laughs> that you guys have to re-watch the entire episode many times to get all this information once again. Uh, we were talking a little bit a while ago about using analytics to inform your decisions. One thing that you mentioned was about you might have a page that's very popular but you have a really high bounce rate. Focus your energies and solve that problem. Uh, another hot tip in terms of how do you do user interviews is listen more than you talk. And I love this. Ask the question and then give them space to speak. Count to five. The design sprint kit.com with Google and also win a mobile with Google. That's just that part. <laughs> this is the second summary. <laughs> this summary has to be broken into two parts. Part one, part two. This is uh, the Google end game, if you will. <laughs> here's here's the big idea, the big idea, Matthew, <laughs> uh, about instant. Okay, so you want to make sure that whatever you're doing loads fast, that you can use the concept of skeleton screens to give context to hack the user perception. You shared this the whole thing about the Houston airport, about the, the wait time. The wait time seems really long. Just make them walk longer and it's fine. <laughs> Okay, you want to have your navigation front and center because there's a perceived speed increase versus having multiple steps to get what you want. This is the individual buttons versus the hamburger menu symptom. You want to be able to surface information and the content the users want up front. And you, sometimes you can use the stagger animation approach, which is starting slow and then it builds faster, creates illusion of speed. Uh, you want to focus on first impressions. And we have 50 milliseconds to make that impression, some data here to set the user expectations. And there's a scary stat that 88% of consumers won't return based on a bad experience. Use creative copywriting to tell the concise story. You want to have thoughtful color schemes. And in thoughtful meaning, make it easy to read. Don't make it a struggle for people to, to read and see. Uh, you also want to be able to set not just a financial budget, but a performance budget to apply restrictions. So this is the first time I heard this phrase, the first contentful paint. Woo! Look that up the speed index and the time to interactive, how long it takes for them to actually engage with the content. You want to make that very fast. In terms of helpful, make sure things are easier to do. You want to have thoughtful integration and you want to automate the process as much as possible using things like autofill and express checkout. And one of the goals here is to have a UI that's obvious and recognizable. Use the platform, build for it natively. Consistent experience across multiple browsers. Uh, icons are great but there's a level of interpretation that has to happen, so icons and text to minimize that. Whew, capable, PWA, guys, this is a little different than NWA or, or PDA. <laughs> this is talking about the progressive web app, making desktop feel like mobile and using the, the things we've learned from mobile and making a richer experience. Uh, Starbucks, Trivago, Spotify, Twitter were examples of who's been able to do that successfully. Simple things that you can do that add to home screen, push notifications, location, camera, things that you experience like voice on mobile, you can apply to desktop to make sure that's reliable, fast, and engaging. Think mobile first. Guys, Ryan Warrender, this is how you get in touch with him. It's at Ryan Warrender, Twitter on Medium. And for Instagram, it's Ryan.Warrender. And Mustafa is at Mustafa underscore X on Twitter and Medium, and you can look for him on YouTube. You guys, thank you so much for coming on the show and doing this with us. I'm pretty sure after my my brain is like put back inside my head after it's like been <laughs> spilling out on the floor, we probably need to do a follow-up where I'll be a little bit more informed, like, hey, wait, you said this, but I didn't understand that. Or maybe our very smart audience will ask some really great questions that I wasn't smart enough to ask you on the spot. Guys, thank you very much. Everybody give them a round of applause for coming on the show. Thank you very much, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. All right. So, you guys, that's how you get in touch with them. I'm going to play the outro music. We're going to have a bite to eat. Here goes. Thanks. Nothing. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. We love you guys. Thank you for being a sustaining member. The Donuts. See you guys later.